Hello, my Bone Baleen friends. I have something really special for you in this video. I recently did an interview with Dr. Lauren Fishman. I had the opportunity to train under Dr. Fishman for my yoga and osteoporosis certification, and it's a great honor and opportunity to share his knowledge and wisdom with you today. In the interview, my introduction with Dr. Fishman was cut off in the recording, and so I'm going to introduce him to you now. Dr. Lauren Fishman graduated with a philosophy degree from Christ Church, Oxford. After completing his bachelor's degree, he went to Pune, India and studied with BKS Iyengar. He followed up his yoga training by attending Rush Medical School and then completed a residency in a Tufts Harvard program. Currently, he's the medical director of the Manhattan Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in New York City. He also teaches at Columbia University Medical School. Dr. Fishman is involved in ongoing research for integrative medicine, and this is an important part of his medical practice. He's published over 100 papers, including 12 books, and he regularly uses yoga to help people with various medical conditions. In 2005, he began a study to prove his theory that yoga could be used to help osteoporosis. What began as a learning opportunity born of curiosity and a desire to keep people with bone loss safe grew and expanded into multiple studies that have increased in both their size and their scope. He published his first of two research studies regarding osteoporosis in 2016 with his first set of 12 yoga poses. Today, with almost 20 years of dedicated research and over 250,000 clinical hours of people practicing this specialized yoga worldwide, there are no cases of fracture, herniated disc, or other serious injuries of any kind. The majority of study participants have improved bone density, physical strength, balance, and posture, all combining for a reduced fracture risk. So without further ado, I present to you the interview with Dr. Lauren Fishman. Welcome. Thank you. So um, in looking at this, um, one of the first things that I, I think so many people would be really interested in knowing is, how did you become interested in bone health? And what initially prompted you to do this study? How did you originally develop a theory? Well, Okay, you really want to know, this is going to sound a little uh, flapping in the wind, but the truth is, I had a vision, honest to goodness. Uh, I, I I was in India, and I had a party for the, I don't know, 30 or 40 expatriates, and not all expatriates, Indian people too, who were flocking to Mr. Iyengar. And I said, was there a year, and it was I was leaving, I thought I'd give a little party, and I had this lovely, these quarters on the, the the roof of a funky hotel and um, a beautiful garden all around it. And I invited everybody to come. Of course, Mr. Angar, too. I put uh, flowers around and candles and lanterns. They never let you do this today. Had the party, a great party. I was blowing out the candle party I gave you there for Mr. Angar. And... Uh, I, I had this vision afterwards of his bones sort of glistening in the dark. And it wasn't a, a scary vision. It wasn't ghostly skeletons or anything like that. It was, it was strong bones, of, perhaps of a um, opera star, or a baseball player, you know, good, sturdy, healthy bones, but shining. And so it took me 25 years and I had used yoga for many other things in the meantime. And I suddenly realized it was time to look for osteoporosis. And I told my friends and they told me I was nuts, that I would break their bones. And so I did a pilot study first in my office every Tuesday after I had seen the last patient. I invited uh, people to come and I would teach them osteoporosis. That I had, and I'd teach them yoga that I had designed to, to uh, put pressure on the bones that were most likely to fracture. The, the spine, that's the biggest one, the femur, and the hip. And those, not by accident, are the ones measured by the DEXA scan, too. And I had about 200 patients at the time that had osteopenia or osteoporosis. And so I divided them into two groups. And one group I didn't do anything with. And the other group I taught the yoga. And then two years later, I got another DEXA scan on both of them. After teaching them. You know, all kinds of patients. One was a math teacher from Columbia. Um, one was a, uh, a person who washed dishes at a 
and a restaurant nearby. All kinds of folks. And at the end of two years, I was <laughs> I was sitting in my uh, this very desk I was sitting at, and one of my kids walked by and said, Dad, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm looking at this, Dad. He said, you going to publish it? And I said, no, no, this is just a pilot study. I just want to make sure it's safe. And he took one and he said, Dad, send me the data. So I sent him the data, and he went upstairs, and he um, came back down five minutes later and said, Dad, it's significant. <laughs> and then no one could have been more surprised than I, but it was really quite significant. Maybe later on, I'll show you guys. I, I've got it up on an alternate uh, channel right now in case you want to see it and it was significant i published got fire in my belly i got really excited about it and i made a thousand copies of a disc uh, where a couple of friends and i each did the, the beginner the, the intermediate and the advanced poses for all 12 of the poses and uh that's how i did the big study and these people uh one way i advertised them mr Iyengar came to town it was his last visit here and uh I rented the back page of the little like libretto that they give out talking about him. And on the back page, I said, yoga for osteoporosis, those who want to take it, it's free. I will send you a DVD. You have to send me a number of blood tests because I was not testing whether yoga would cure endocrine abnormalities or nutritional deficiencies or hereditary uh, conditions. I was testing whether yoga was good for osteoporosis. So I tried to normalize everybody that went in the study that way. And I did <clears throat> they couldn't be taking drugs either, drugs that affect osteoporosis either. Uh, and um, I got about a, a thousand people. And about, about a week later, I looked at myself in, in the mirror and I said, you know, Dr. Fishman, you're not very smart. You recruited people who are already doing yoga, Mr. Iyengar aficionados. You're taking people who already are doing yoga and have osteoporosis and telling them that they can do yoga to get rid of their osteoporosis. That's not too smart. But it turned out that those very people got better. So it turns out it is a particular type of yoga. I, I make no claims to say these are the only poses or even the best poses, but that's how I proved. That's how I uh, demonstrated that it worked. Now, uh, just one more thing I think worth saying. I was in Haridwar, this sacred city, a pilgrimage city in the north of India, in Uttarakhand, you know, near Rishikesh, up there in the foothills of the Himalayas and the banks of the Ganges. A million people come and worship in the Ganges. They, a, a beautiful medieval city, really. And there was this gigantic auditorium where uh, they invited me and other people to come and uh, talk uh, on some. I was talking about rotator cuffs just before before we did anything with osteoporosis. And as I was walking down from the stage, having given my talk to people, I did applaud. I mean, they were applauding. I was wondering who should walk up on the stage but Mr. Iyengar. It was like a statistical miracle. I didn't go to Pune to see him because I said, my wife is not into yoga, so I wasn't going to uh, do that to her, make her be there and uh, undergo that. So I didn't go. I felt like a heel not going, but there he was. So I said to him, he was walking up and I'm walking down. Uh, and I said to him, Mr. I am, he said, oh, fish, fish, fisher. I said, no, fishman. He said, oh, fishman. Yeah. And then I said, Mr. I am, if this is the last time you were to see me, and it was, what would you say? And to his everlasting credit, he did not come up with his one of his many flip remarks, which he had, and he had many. He could have just said that he was going up on the stage, about to give a talk, a little nervous probably, but he didn't do that. He stopped for a second and thought for a minute, and he said, you only rent your body. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant your body is part of the universe, take care of it, you're just inhabiting it, so treat it like a decent, respectful tenant. You know, take don't give yourself slash marks, don't smoke, you know, take care of that body the way you would take care of your, your garden or someone else's garden. And I think that applies to our bones too, that yoga itself is an internal thing. You know, yoga is a, uh, it's a self-improvement program, like the, like the nine day diet. That's what it is, but it's not for your diet, it's for your spirit. It's to get more elevated, to perceive more of what, What's really going on here? And yoga for osteoporosis is not that. Yoga for osteoporosis is using yoga as a tool to uh, achieve a very secular end, stronger bones. So it's not quite the same.
Okay, enough on that question. <laughs> you just asked me, how did I think of it? Look what I did. Okay. I think it's really interesting to hear. I, I think there's always an interesting story as to why this matters and how it came to be. And I think it's 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 fun to hear. So the next question that we have on our list is, is yoga dangerous for osteoporosis? Well, as you said in your introduction, we now have well over 250,000 hours of people doing this yoga, most of whom are over 65 and most very the great majority of whom have either osteoporosis or osteopenia, and many of whom have never done yoga before, and a good number of which have minimal training. The training they get is in the DVD or from a, a, a lesson or two, and yet we have no zero fractures uh, in, in the spine or the hip or the femur or anywhere else. We have um, no herniated discs, uh, rotator cuffs, uh, meniscal tears, no injuries of any consequence yet. I'm sure if the statistics go further, the law of averages will come up with some, but it seems to be entirely safe. A, a colleague of mine, uh, there was a book written by Bill Broad called uh, The Science of Yoga, which sort of um, goes largely into the injuries that come from yoga. And there are some in the uh, Annals of Yoga. And she uh, said, she want to see how dangerous yoga is. She, so she looked at admissions to the emergency rooms in the United States in uh, over a, a certain number of year period. And she compared yoga with weightlifting and golf. Now, guess which is the one that accounts for the most uh, emergency room uh, visits uh, per capita, you know, considering how many people are practicing? Golf. <laughs> golf is the most dangerous of the three. Oh, treacherous golf, the treacherous 17th fairway. And uh, weightlifting was second. And yoga was significantly down from weightlifting. So it's, in general, yoga is very safe. And the yoga that we're promoting here seems to be even safer. <clears throat> um, I think it's really interesting to think about. Uh, there are so many people in the bone health community who... Um, who have limitations or other issues in their body where they have um, arthritis or maybe they've had a knee replaced or even a hip replaced and having something that is low impact that they can do that actually makes a difference to bones is a huge, huge thing. Oh, I do want to ask one yoga. little follow-up question thinking about, is there anything that's dangerous? Are there yoga poses that people should avoid if they have bone loss? Mm, I I can't. Uh, yes, there are. Yes. I mean, if you have osteoporosis in a big time way, forward bends in general, where you round your back forward, uh, should be considered no-nos. Let me see if I have something I can use. Um, wait just a sec. Here's something. Uh, I'm going to make this, pretend that this is a spinal vertebra, okay? This is a vertebra. Well, if this is, if this person is facing this way, then here's the back and here's the front. And right up here at the front of the vertebrae, this is where all the osteoporotic fractures occur. I, I've seen literally, I mean, more than a thousand, and they're all right up here. Now, what does that mean? It means they come from putting too much pressure on the front of the vertebra. So if this person is leaning, is facing that way and they start to lean forward and they round their back like this, they're putting more and more pressure right there. So th those are poses that are wise to avoid. I, mean, I, can, I can enlarge on this warning by saying, once you have one fracture there, there are always wedge fractures. So instead of this, the top of the vertebra being there, it's tilted like that. So from that point on, they are obligatorily leaning forward because it's this is not flat anymore, it's tilted. So a second fracture is even more likely than the first, believe it or not. And then if you have two, the third fracture is even more probable. So it's a good, it's a good cascade not to start. So now, does, it, does this apply to bringing your back down if you keep your back straight? No. If you can really keep your back straight, I'm hesitating when I say this because people think they keep their back straight and they don't. If you have osteoporosis and you're thinking of doing forward bends, consult one of the teachers out there who really know what they're talking about. I mean, we have 
we have trained how many? Uh, over 600 teachers we have now in just about every state. And you can access them online, too. If you go to the web, my website, sciatica.org, you go there and you go to uh, osteoporosis or teacher certification. And you see they're all certified. And they, they will be able to tell you. And But there are substitute poses you can do. That is also true uh, if you have had a total hip, as you mentioned, Sarah. There are ways, there are workarounds for these poses that are uh, uh, equally effective as far as we can tell so far. So uh, there are many, there are, you know, various adjustments you do have to make. And the, for, for the hip, for example, there's the anterior approach and the posterior approach and the lateral approach. And there are different no-nos and different Thing, different capacities in each of them that are really important. That's it. That's in my book too. You know, this latest book coming out. <clears throat> I'm excited for the latest book. I think it's going to be great. I'll have to add to my growing library over here. <laughs> the next question is for your initial study, how did you find and select participants? What characteristics were you looking for and why? Mm -hmm. None. I was not. All I wanted was that they didn't have. I mean, there were certain blood tests that I did. I looked to make sure their thyroid was OK, their parathyroid was OK, uh, their, um, their their CBC, their blood count, uh, that uh, some other tests like that. that I don't think I have to go in. Their vitamin D levels were OK. Uh, they didn't have an inflammatory condition. And probably also important was whether their osteoclasts were very active or not active. I would take them in either case, but I wanted to know. So I measured their, it's called their urine NTX. These are the cells that gobble up bone and return their elements to the systemic circulation. They go into your bloodstream, they get excreted usually. <clears throat> uh, and um, I wanted to make sure, I just wanted to know what the level was. I didn't exclude anybody. Anybody who didn't have normal levels, I wouldn't let them in the study until they normalized them. So I would write back to them and say, um, or call them and say, uh, uh, go see an endocrinologist or go go see a nutritionist. Your vitamin D is too low. You know, I would, I, and once they were normal, I would admit them to the study. I, I would take anybody who was a normal person, that, and some were young, and a small number, like about forty-five, did not have osteoporosis. They just didn't want to get it. So I let them in the study too. So they were not the most significant group that, that gained bone. They they didn't have any problems. But the most significant group, I should tell you a little more about the study. What we did is people had to give us a DEXA scan from two years before they entered the study. So like if they were entering today in 2024, they had to have a DEXA from 2023 or 2022 or earlier. And then we saw what happened to their bone mineral density for their hip, for their femur, for their spine in the years between when they that earlier DEXA was taken and when they entered the study. Now, overwhelmingly, they lost bone. Then we looked at what happened in the two years between when they entered the study and were in the study for two years. And we compared what happened in the interval before they took the yoga and the interval after they took the yoga. Uh, and they couldn't, uh, it, it, a couple of people were on medicines and they stopped the medicines before they started the study. And that put us as a disadvantage because what happens is when you take the medicines, they don't always work, but when they work, you gain bone. And then when you stop, you have a precipitous loss of bone. So that's what we, we were inheriting this precipitous loss, but it, it seemed to work anyway. <clears throat> and, um, then we treated everybody the same. As I say, I recruited many of them through this libretto on the, when Mr. Iyengar was in town. Some were my patients in my office. Some call, read about it and called me up. And some came through the internet. They came through all kinds of places. And we didn't. We we followed up uh, with them periodically. We I had a website. I had a pre med student who was really gung ho, and she made a uh, a website so people could go there and learn all kinds of things about osteoporosis and the study. And people went there, and we would call them up. Not not even I would say it was more like once a year. Certainly not every month. Uh, and we did not have an online database then. We do for later studies, but we did not. We just trusted people, acknowledging that people tell doctors what they think the doctors want to hear. So if anything, we overestimated their actual participation in the study. 
The only condition we insisted on was that whatever they were doing before, if they were doing nothing, couch potatoes or doing jazzercise and hiking 20 miles a day, whatever it was they were doing before, they should continue doing. Every clinical study is, as they say, dirty because, you know, you don't have spaghetti the same number of times in the next two years. You know, you, you live. <clears throat> and so that is always true. But you hope that the variations shake out by the number of patients in the study. I, I, I said, I, when, when my son prompted me to write this up as a paper, because it was statistically significant, I, I made a thousand copies of this and I just gave them away to people who would send in these blood tests that we need or bring them in if they were my patients or mail them in. <clears throat> and given the condition that they should do, they have to do exact, as much as they can, whatever they were doing in the two years previously, they should continue. And if they took any medicines, they had to let us know. And sometimes they decided to take a medicine for that would affect their bones. And we would say, that's, you know, go ahead. And then we'd take them out of the study. <laughs> In fact, we would take them out of the study. You know, we, we, we didn't have want any of that. Because then you're confused. Are they getting better because of the medicine or because of the yoga? <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's what we did. The average age of people in our study was 682 and uh, about 80% of them had osteoporosis or osteopenia. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting to know specifically that um, people that participated in, and finished the study out were people that were not taking medicine so that you were able to just measure the effects of yoga um, on, on bone. I think that's a really important point. So this this <laughs> article that was, was written said, oh, he, t he took out a lot of people with vitamin D deficiencies and he took out the people with thyroid abnormalities. But those are a lot of the people that have osteoporosis. That betrays a wild, uh, in, wildly uh, unrealistic uh, ignorance of science. Because science, you always want to control for everything but the variable you're looking at. I mean, if you're looking at people, you're looking whether penicillin cures pneumonia, you're not taking people that have cancer. They have other, you know, if you have lung cancer, you have other reasons for having problems with your lungs. You want to exclude those people, even though people with lung cancer do get pneumonia. You want to look just at pneumonia itself. And here, too, we just want to look at yoga itself. <clears throat> I think that's a really important thing um, for people to understand generally about um, not just your study, but every scientific study that's out there, that there are always parameters and that we're trying to bring things down into the smallest category possible so that we can just measure what, what's being studied. I think that's a really important thing to understand about the scientific process. It really is. I mean, in mice, they just, you know, they have these uh, New Zealand mice and these Hainsley sprawling mice that are identical you know, they've bred them. It's like cloning them. They have 10,000 mice that are identical. They feed them the same food. They're in the same cages. The same number of days go by before they give them whatever they're giving them. And that's that's good, but that ain't people. And, you know, in, I suppose in some utterly totalitarian regime, you could say, you go in that cell. You eat nothing but rice and water for three months. You know, you could do that, but we're not doing that here. Thank God we're not doing that here. You know, I'm all in favor of scientific discovery in advance, but not at that price. <clears throat> Too expensive. Yeah. Too expensive. <laughs> yes, there's. it's an interesting thing to consider. Um, looking at the, the first study that you did, it was curiosity and it was self-funded. I, I think that's also interesting for people to understand um, that that you wanted to learn. And I think that desire to learn and then looking at Whenever there's a scientific study, there's also a limit to what can we afford to do here, too. <laughs> it's a huge thing. The, the, uh, the, the thrill of it was finding people all over the world. You know, I had patients in Saudi Arabia and in, in Thailand. I had patients in um, the, the islands off of Australia, you know, Tasmania. And it, to look at the yoga working in all these places, I mean, and with all kinds of DEXA scans, so I had one woman with a minus 5.7. And she was absolutely adamant. She wasn't going to take a medicine no matter what. But the yoga she loved and the same fervor that the same, that created the antipathy to medicines gave her an affinity to yoga. And she really did it well. And she, it's a nice story. <clears throat> I would love to hear that story sometime. 
<laughs> um, going on to our next question. Um, how did you, so this is one that I think you've already partially spoken to, and I think that it would be interesting to actually compare looking at the first study to what's happening, um, now in, in current research, but how did you, looking at, you know, where people reported, and then now that it's so much easier to report using the internet, but how did you monitor the participation and the results for study participants? And then how often did you check in with them? in the first study and then now as it's grown and, and what are you doing with current research both? Oh, it's a big question. Okay, in the, in the, fir the absolute first study, this pilot study, I saw them every week. And so I saw who came and who didn't come. And I saw who participated looking at their watch and staring out the window and doing their hair, you know, and who really was trying it almost to the point of shaking. You know, who were these people and how involved were they really? And what I could tell by the questions they asked and uh, w w how they related to me on, on a weekly basis. I, in the bigger study, I, did, I, was, I couldn't control that well, and I didn't. Uh, as I say, we would call them up and talk to them or communicate with them by the Internet at least once a year. But in many cases, it was a lot more than that. And in some cases, it was less. And we had this day, this. Uh, uh, website, which I think is still out there, called it yoga versus osteoporosis. Dot, I don't know if it's dot org or dot com. I don't remember. I'm not using it now, but I think it's still up. There. I'm still paying for it, and it's um, a, a way to sort of it's sort of like a community center. And they had, did have uh, one of these online chat spaces. I'm not, you know, it was uh, through Google or or you know some old fashioned thing. It's like ten years ago, and they. Uh, they communicated with each other and asked all kinds of questions. And I would tune in on that to see what was going on. And there were like crazes. They went crazy over urine pH for a while. And everybody was dipping the litmus paper inside their urine. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how relevant that is in the vast majority of cases. But they were doing that. And they had things on nutrition where they would go wild over um, goatee berries. You know, the different things that they went nuts about. But uh, as long as they all did it, it was okay with me. You know, did they all take goatee berries? No, but that's within the, the realm of something that you consider trivial. Or... <clears throat> so we didn't monitor them in the big study as well as I would have liked to. How many started um, uh, spin, spin classes in, in the, that period? I really don't know. But as I say, I uh, reiterated as much as I could. Don't change anything. Whatever you did in those years, you are a, you are a guinea pig, and you must treat yourself with that kind of uh, objectivity and abstinence, you know. And I hope I think most of them did. Uh, so that's the answer to that one. Now, uh, there was another part to the question: What are you doing now? What are you doing in future studies? Was that part of it? <clears throat> yeah, sort of. And there, I yes. have to make a confession. Yes, I was wondering. So what's changed? How are you tracking now in current studies that's different than what was happening before? Because I think you, that's just interesting as technology has become easier to use. And Oh, the technology got easier and it got better. And my uh, co-presenter, Liz Larson, created a database so that each week, each everybody in the, the latest study, um, and we're, we're about to do one in Kerala in India, and we're translating it into the uh, Tamil and maybe into Hindi too for this. It's in Kerala, which is like, it's like a very nice socially uh, coherent state. And uh, there we may translate it, but we have this database now. And every Sunday, every person in the study puts down how many poses they did that week, how long they held them, and how many days of the week they did them. So there's a fourth parameter, which is how hard they tried, which I'm putting in. I had to invent a scale. There was only one Swedish scale, and it was for the heart. And some of it was relevant. A lot of it wasn't relevant because, you know, they breathe more quickly in yoga. In yoga, you're not supposed to breathe more quickly. It didn't really fit. But we, we've invented everything. I've given webinars, so I invite everybody to a free gathering. And then we talk about the, the different levels. How do you all rate this? How do you all rate that? And then I could see if they're inter and intra rate of reliability, because otherwise it's just garbage. You know, it, it's, it doesn't it doesn't cohere. There's if there's no objectivity in it. And how do you determine the objectivity? By the uniformity. If everybody or almost everybody answers the question the same way, 
And due to the internet, everybody in the study could see the same person doing uh, the twisted triangle and decide, is this a little effort, some effort, considerable effort, or maximal effort? There were four levels. There are and so that we and the people rate themselves. It wasn't a reasonable way to get teachers to rate them, though some people did have teachers rate them too. And we can compare. I've compared in like 50 patients the teacher rating with the student rating. And you know what? They're almost identical. They're not identical. They're really very close. Very close. It's very surprising to me. So uh that's the way we're monitoring them now. And Liz with her eagle eye is looking at these results every week. And if somebody doesn't write in for a couple of weeks, they get a they get a letter. They might even get a, a phone call. You know, are you still in the study? Are you, you know, <laughs> as as tactfully as can, as we can, we're getting them to put the data in. And, and the very few people have quit. One uh, uh, there was one episode someone had cancer and had to quit. Another person had cancer and said, "I don't think I'm going to quit. I'm going to stay in it." Now we don't know what to do with her data. She gets an asterisk, you know, <laughs> but. Um, that's how we're monitoring it now. And they stay in for two years and then they get another DEXA. And because they don't get a, you know, you, they, it's not like exactly two years. It may be two years in a month or uh, one one year and nine months or so. So we, we grade their changes on a monthly basis, not on a yearly basis, because they're not full years. So you can't do that. So uh, that's that's how we're doing the studies now. And we have Is some, there any some follow people- up with, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm seeing people ask in the chat um, if there's follow-up with um, study participants after they've left the study to see whether they continue or what happens. Very interesting. That's just what I was going to say, that we now have some people who've been doing the yoga for, you know, consistently for six years and some, a few for eight, and they get their DEXA scan every two years. And that's an interesting thing. Um I'm trying to think of how to explain this. Well, if you look at the medicines, like the bisphosphonates or even uh, the ones that are artificial thyroid, parathyroid hormones, uh, Timlos and Forteo, at first they take off like gangbusters. Your, your bone mineral density is growing like this for about three to six months. Then if you go another six months, they're leveling off. And if you go two to three years, they're almost flat, which means what? It means they're not gaining any bone at all. You're taking the medicine, it's not doing you any good. Some of them, like Timlos, you can't take for three years, but the bisphosphonates you can take, uh, many do take them for much more uh, than two years. And it level, it almost, they almost gaining no bone. They are gaining a tiny bit, but that's that's what happens to them. The yoga, at least for the people we've measured for six years, and it is not, yet a statistically significant cohort. So if I were graphing it, I'd put this in a dotted line. It continues to go up at the same slope. This is not as fast as the medicines at first. The medicines are going like this and the yoga is going like this. But then the medicines level out and the yoga crosses and exceeds it. The yoga does not seem to have a time-limited efficacy. It just goes on being as good so far. I mean, and we have people in their 80s, a lot of people in their 80s, and even more in their 70s and 60s. That so, is fascinating to think yeah. about the medication leveling off and the yoga continues. And the yoga crosses, like, it's like the, the, the rabbit and the hare. The yoga is the, is the not the rabbit and the hare, the rabbit and the tortoise. The, to- the, the rabbit takes off like crazy, but then stops to eat some carrots. And the tortoise just keeps pl- plotting on and the tortoise gets there first. There's, I've seen um, quite a few comments in the chat that are coming up. The the patient that you mentioned who had a negative 5.7, people are wondering what happened to your patient if she had improvements with help medication. Yes. Now, to make a long story short, yes, she had improvement. I lost touch. This is one from Tasmania, and I didn't keep it in touch with her long enough as much as I would have liked. My my strong suspicion is that she's still doing the yoga now, 10 years later. I may look her up and call her because it is it is a matter of some interest. Yeah. And this Thank is, you. wait, you know, I think I'm going to go to, let me go to my, uh, I, I, I recorded, I just saw a patient, what is today, the 30th? I saw her on the 28th, day before yesterday. 
And I've got her results. I just have them. Hold on a minute. I'm going to try to share the screen. Yeah. Mm. I think I can do it. Let's see if this There's is the a green button that you could click on on your screen that will allow you to share. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to say save, but don't get rid of it. Oh, it got rid of it. Oh, wait. Uh, now I'm sorry. Is there another question you can ask while I'm fiddling around and doing this? I mean, I'm just going to go. Absolutely. Yeah, go so um, the next question is, um, how did you define, um, how did, how did your study define a gain in bone mineral density? Oh, okay. That's, that's easy. And I can just show you very easily. We looked at what happened in the two years before they were in the study. And we compared what, what, how they were when they started with how they were when they ended. And then we we looked at them, as I was saying, from when they when they joined the study to two years later. And we didn't look at the T scale. We looked at the actual bone mass. You know, we looked at the real thing, the how much bone loss or gain did they get in that period? And it was uh, that. So that's what we looked at. We looked at the, whether they were losing bone or gaining bone in that two year period. And then we compared what happened in the two year period that they were in the study with what happened in the two or sometimes more year period when they weren't in the study. And again, we graded it by month, not by year, because the years and the months uh, were not were not consistent. Now, just hold on one second. Let me see if I can get this up because I I believe I can. Hmm. Here it is. Yeah, okay. So now let me go back and share the screen. Ready? I'm going to share screen here with you. Can you see this deforming force? Do you see this? Yes. Yeah, okay. I don't want to show you that one now. I'm going to show you that. But, oh, here's one. Here's the pilot study. Here are the people, uh, the hundred or so people that joined this one who didn't get anything. This is the control group in purple here. They had no... Uh, this is the spine, and this is the hip. And you can see the control group. They lost a little bone, what you'd expect them to lose. But here are the yogis that I taught every Tuesday night after my work <clears throat> that my son found significant. And here's where it was published in 2009. My goodness, 15 years ago. Okay, and here's this study. Here's the big study that I'm talking about right now uh, with Yishe uh, Lu and... Um, Bernard Rosner, he's the head of um, statistics at the Deaconess and Brigham and Women's Hospital up at Harvard. He's a biostatistician, a professor. And here are the results of the study. He did the statistics. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Gregory Chang is part of it. I'll tell you about him too. So here's before, in those two years before they joined the study, here's what happened. In the two years after they started doing yoga, here's what happened. Now this is the spine. And this is the, we do better with the spine than anything else. Here's the hip, which was not statistically significant. You see these little brackets? These are 95% uh, confidence intervals. And you can see with the spine, there's a lot of empty space in here, which is good. It means they're highly significant. This was like 0 0.009, something like that, and it's significant. It's meaning that nine out of out of 10,000 people would, have, would get this. Okay, or 1,000, nine out of 1,000. And here, look at those confidence intervals. They're huge because... Uh, I, d I was ignorant. I didn't know at the time that there are different ways of measuring the hip. And you, I was comparing apples and oranges. Some would measure Ward's triangle, some wouldn't, some would. Uh, there were different things they'd measure. So it, it turned out they did gain bone even with this confounding factor, but not as much. And uh, as I say, not significant. When it comes to the femur, which is the most serious fracture you can have. This is the one where 25% of the people who sustain this kind of fracture die. Another 25% enter a nursing facility from which they will never emerge. And the other 50% do return to their normal lives. But here too, you can see um, that they, uh, the confidence intervals are fully separated. And as long as they're separated like that, that is highly significant. So, so what did Dr. Chang do? Dr. Chang is at NYU. He has what is currently the most powerful MRI on earth. It is shared by the University of Northern Finland, where they also have a, the same MRI. It's seven Tesla. 
The normal one is like 1.6 and the best ones out now are three. But this is seven. And he is devoted, he's an MD, PhD, and he's devoted to studying not the outside of the bone, but the inside of the bone where the trabeculae are. Uh, let me see if I can find an example of that for you. Yeah, here. Suppose this is a bone. Then all the DEXA scan measures is everything that's around the periphery, the very outside, that's the cortex, a couple of millimeters thick, but it's uh, it's important and that's what that measures. And it's correlated with fracture. The better your bone is there, the less fractures you have. But then there's the inside of the bone and there are these trabeculae, these cross struts and supports inside, which are not at all measured by the DEXA scan. Uh, they're called trabeculae. And they, according to people who've studied this more in greater detail than I, this, these trabeculae account for anywhere from 30 to 70% of the strength of the bone. Now, what do I mean by strength of the bone? It's resistance to fracture. So this unmeasured commodity is also highly related to whether you fracture or not. And what Greg Chang has found, looking at now close to 40 people in the study at various times, is that the yogis have better than average trabeculae. Now, we're going to get a, a quantitative measure by sending it down to the University of Pennsylvania, where they're going to do something called a finite element analysis, which is the way engineers determine the strength of a bridge. You know, if you take a rural drive, you see uh, uh, a sign, no more than 7,000 pounds on this bridge. How do they determine that? This is the way they do it. And so they will determine how many pounds this bone can uh, sustain without fracturing itself. So that's that's so now you, that's the long and the short of it, I think. Now let's see if there's anything else I was going to show you at this point. Uh, oh yeah, this woman. Well, here we are. Here she is. I I blocked her name out. This was three twenty eight twenty four. Here she is. This is her femur, two thousand twenty three. Minus 2.5. Here she is in 2024, minus 2.0. This is on the T scale. She has gained a half a point on the T scale. Here's the that's the left. The right, she only gained point, you know, not quite half a point. The radius, that's her forearm. She just gained a little bit there, but on the left, but on the right, she gained half a point. And in the spine, she also gained half a point. She's just she's not even really osteoporotic anymore in the spine or in either femur. She's got a little osteoporosis still, or quite a bit actually, in the radius. But that's the only bone that is osteoporotic at this point. After, not it's not after two years either. It's in one year. I mean, this is not your average. She did better than the average, but that's what it is. Now, let me show you one. I could show you a couple of other slides that are relevant here. The reason we measured the actual bone rather than the dexa rather than the T scale is because. This is a this is a bell shaped curve for the frequency of, of a certain value. Studying a hundred thousand healthy women between the ages of twenty five and thirty. Not I didn't do this. This is when they started measuring osteoporosis. They did this, and you can see one sigma, one standard deviation below the mean, is thirty four percent of the people. Now. So the T scale would, would be minus one here, but it would represent being worse than 34% of the people, a 34% uh, decline. Whereas if you went out to the difference between two and three standard deviations, it's only 2% of the people because it's it's highest here and it goes down. Here, a little bit of change is a lot of difference in the standard deviation. Whereas uh, the bone, actual amount bone in there is a, is a linear quantity and is a much better one for doing calculations, in my opinion. So that's why we did that. Now, as long as I'm here, though, I'm going to show you, uh, this is an, this comes from Dr. Chang. This is an actual uh, bone quality study. This is, you spend an hour in this very potent MRI. This person has a lot of osteoarthritis, too. But you can see, these are all these trabeculae inside. You can see this only this very powerful MRI. There's some down here, but right here in the region where the most dangerous fractures occur, there's a trabecular paucity. There aren't enough. So this part of the bone is particularly vulnerable and frangible. I just thought I'd show you that. I've got some Frankensteinian stuff to show you too. 
But I think that's enough for right now. Let me go back. Let me stop the share. And Sarah can ask me some more questions, <laughs> which I'm sure you're eager to do. So um, the next question is one that I think really you answered, but um, it's it is it's asking, what is bone quality and does yoga affect it? Um, and I'm thinking that when you had the slides up, you really spoke to that question, the, looking at the trabeculae. Actually summarize it. Bone density is, is, as we said, just measuring the periphery, the absolute circumference of the bone. Then there's the trabeculae. And bone quality is a compendious measure. It includes both the trabeculae in the middle and the bone mineral density at the outside. Now, bone mineral density may seem like a bit of a misnomer because there is bone in the inside too, but you could just say bone at the bone around the edges plus bone in the middle. So you get the whole picture, and that gives you bone quality, which really can be translated into full bone strength, not just the strength that is donated by the periphery and not just the strength that comes from the trabeculae inside. It's both. And yoga... As I say, the study that we did shows that yoga does improve the outside of the bone. And the study that we did and Dr. Chang um, did too, shows that yoga does increase the strength and the uh, structural capacity of what's on the inside. So the short answer to the question is yes. Is that, did I, there was another little part of that question though, wasn't there? Well, there... Um, there is, it's, it's, does yoga affect the, um, the bone quality, which I think is really interesting to look at. Yeah, bone, do, bo yoga does, and uh, yoga does other things too, which I think we should mention that doesn't come from pills, doesn't come from weightlifting, uh, which does improve your bone mineral density, your weightlifting does, and doesn't come from these vibrational machines, which also are effective in raising your bone mineral density with some qualifications, you know some caveats about it. But yoga also improves your balance. It improves your uh, posture. Critical elements for spinal fractures, that's the posture. And for balance, that's every other fall and including uh, spinal fractures too. It improves your range of motion, your strength, uh, refines your coordination and uh, reduces your anxiety. All of which are factors contributing to falls. So these are things that you never, the doctor rolling a pill across the desk isn't going to improve your posture, uh, you know, and there aren't many other methods that come close. Uh, I, I think that's really important for people to understand. I think um, where Dr. Fisherman keeps mentioning that um, we have compression fractures in the spine, um, I also hear them referred to as postural fractures. Mm -hmm. And looking at how yoga can help improve posture, it, it's really significant what that, that does for improving the, the risk of fracture. It really does. I mean, there was a study done by, uh, at the Mayo Clinic, a woman named Mirshid Sinaki did a study in which she studied back bends versus forward bends and its effect on the vertebrae. And she had to stop the study because there were so many fractures from people bending forward. And this is a study that has been repeated several times. Uh, masters repeated it and other people have repeated it. It's the truth. So it, it just, you know, they, she replicated what a crummy posture does to you and found that it really did produce fractures. It's a huge thing. Um, then there's, there's something interesting in looking at how... Um, how yoga puts stress on bone. That was something that I think is really interesting and important to discuss. Um, from your research, what's the mechanism that causes these yoga poses to put good stress on bones that actually promotes bone growth? Not and so then twist is an addition to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You, you, were you going to say something else in addition to that? The twist being like the follow on. Um, so there's a question there about, you know, what's the mechanism? And then I think it's important to bring up twists specifically, but it's a follow on to the previous. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to perform a death defying act and make me able to share my screen again. Give it a try. Linda, fold your, I'm on it. 
hold your hands. You can share your screen again. Thank you. Well, but now I'm not seeing it. It's not coming up that way. You sure? Because I'm, I'm, I'm clicking down there and nothing is happening. Oh, yeah, here it is. It was not your fault at all. Okay, well, we looked at the trabeculae and all that, but now we want to look further. We want to look at some other stuff. If you look... Uh, oh, no, let me start. I'm going to go to that one, but let me start somewhere else. Here. The reason yoga, the way yoga works is yoga deforms, this, it puts enough pressure on the little cells, the osteoblasts, so that their membrane, the outside of the cell, the cell membrane is this brilliant structure and a little force indicated here by this green arrow deforms the, uh, the cell membrane and that energy gets transduced into an electron volt inside the cell. And that electron volt powers a chemical reaction, creating a new molecule that wafts its way down to the nucleus, enters the nucleus, and upregulates certain, certain DNA and downregulates other DNA. So that then when it makes, it, it connects to the uh, ribosomes and makes new proteins. It's making proteins it never made before called osteon. And they get extruded from the cell and pick up phosphorus and calcium and become what's called a, 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 a actual bone. Uh, hydroxyapatite is its name. Now, let me just show you. This has been proven at every level with the atomic microscope and various highly sophisticated chemical uh, experiments. There's physical stress. The physical stress stimulates the mechanoreceptors. That's where the, this brilliant cell membrane that translates a mechanical force into an electrical force, an electron volt. And that uh, activates new DNA and the new DNA synthesizes a new protein. It extrudes the protein, which attracts phosphates and calcium, which makes bone. And as I say, every step of this chain has been, you know, rigorously um, uh, experimented upon. And this has been found to be the case. So the way yoga makes bone is just the way nature intended us to make bone. Stress on a bone stimulates the bone to make new bone. And what is Wolf's Law? The architectonic, meaning the substructure, the support of a bone, the architectonic of a bone follows the lines of force to which the bone is subjected. So I didn't have a slide for this, but when you're born, your femur is just straight as a fat little arrow. And by the time your femur is your thigh bone, and by the time you're five, your, your femur is bent like this, you know, the characteristic crook that it has in it that I was showing you before. I'll show it to you again. This. Uh, the, 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 the crook here, the tilt. And that tilt comes from walking. Little children who are born, who unfortunately have spina bifida or other conditions that paralyze them, when they're five, their bone is just this straight. It hasn't moved at all. So it's not that it's inborn in us that we're going to get this crook in our femur. Not at all. It's the, all the femur has in it is the capacity to respond to stresses. And th that capacity to stress this is what I'm talking about right here. Now, if you look at a yoga pose, you see that being in warrior two puts the femur at fabulous mechanical disadvantage. I mean, the, the weight is here, but the femur is way out there. So there's a tremendous uh, mechanical disadvantage, particularly at the neck of the femur, that place that fractures so catastrophically. You're bringing your right shoulder forward and your left shoulder back, and your right chest forward. So there's torque at the femoral head. You're twisting your whole torso this way. And there's vertebral twisting too with the lateral, with lateral pressure on the, on the uh, spine itself. So that's I mean, just one example of a yoga pose and how it works. So going over it in the femur, it's just gravity pulling down in this long flat bone. At the femoral neck, it's the twist. When you do this pose properly, you twist the knee outward, which would be counterclockwise to the person doing the pose. And that puts more stress right here on the neck of the femur. 
and you're twisting your whole torso to be in line with your hips. So you're doing a twist there too. Now there's a study uh, by a, a Christoph Fellino and others in Italy. Uh, it's a macabre study, it really is. They took <laughs> cadavers and they, they took cadaverous uh, vertebrae. They took the vertebrae out, embedded them in concrete and inserted little um, pressure gauges all over the place. Well, you see those little pressure gauges? This is anterior, anterior right, anterior, anterior left, anterior left, 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 posterior left, all around. And then they accounted for the weakening of the bone by virtue of their having drilled these holes in it. So it's a good study. And then they measured the strains. And here, the, the various things to which they subjected the bone, up and down right here with the blue line. Then they tilted at various places. And they also did it from right in front, which is what Mirshid Sanaki did. It's like bending forward. And they found that the risk of fractures and the pressures right up here in the front were fabulously great. Um, but then they also twisted them uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. And they measured them. And here's the twisting. This is the way twisting works. Twists can be used to help safely build the bone. Remember we said, well, if pressure is going to make the bone get stronger, why don't we bend forward and put pressure on the front of the bone? Answer, you put too much pressure that way and you're going to cause the fractures you're intending to uh, prevent. So what do you do? Well, it just occurred to me um, that a circular motion could put pressure on the front of the bone without mounting that pressure high enough to cause a fracture. And if you look at it, look at AAR here. It's the highest. So turn, so twisting is actually the thing. This is clockwise twisting. It's the same for counterclockwise. It, it, it raises the, the pressure somewhat, uh, the, the normal strain, but it doesn't raise it so high that you cause a fracture. This is, it's, it's the way a, a great German chemist, Kekulé, discovered the, the the benzene ring without which there would be no biochemistry. He thought of the um, the phoenix, the Egyptian symbol for life, which is a snake eating its own tail. It's a round thing. And that's how he figured out that sometimes organic molecules are not long strings, but they cause rings. And I, I was thinking of him and his brilliance when I figured out that twists might work. And then Christoph Fellini came along and proved that it really is true. So, I just wanted to show you that here. Here's the Frankensteinian model crushing the vertebra. You know, look at all these wires. They're a fantastic thing. So that's, that's what I wanted to show you. So now I can end this. I'm going to stop the share. There, we did it without a hitch and all is well. So it's perfect. <laughs> no hitches. No hitches. Now, I believe we have gone. Uh, uh, would you have more questions? Go ahead, ask. I'm I'm yours. Oh my goodness, I appreciate that. Um, so, um, there are other questions. There are actually there are actually tons of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, I'm not sure how much time you have available today to to answer them. Um, yeah. Look at it, Sarah, you might find that the same question comes up a number of times. So let's do that. Let's get many birds with one question. And if you can. <laughs> yes. I'm trying that. to look and see if there are some that are, are being asked repeatedly. Um, Otherwise, just ask one you think is a good question. Well, I thought that it was really interesting when you're talking about um, looking at the numbers and seeing how there is an improvement in the femoral neck and then looking at um, the MRI picture that you had and that there's a deficit there. Are there things that can be done that really help improve things at the femoral neck? Well, you I mean, that's what I'm in, in the study I'm doing now. Uh, I, I realized when I got done with this first study and was so very happy that it worked, I realized I didn't know which pose did what. I didn't even know if all 12 poses did anything. For all I knew, there was one pose that did it all. And the other poses were just fun to do, but they weren't really valuable for building bone. So I did another study in which we're fastidiously monitoring who does which pose for how long, how many times a week. And then we're going to, and we're looking at their DEXA scans to see 
which poses, you know, the it, it's a complex statistical thing called ANCOVA, analysis of covariance, where you say, okay, they did this pose, this pose, and this pose more than the other poses, and uh, the neck of their femur got better than the average. You know, then we'll have some inkling about what's going on here. Um, at, at present, we don't know, and uh, we don't, we really don't know what I suspect and I can't use a stronger word because I have no proof, uh, is that Paravrita poses, like Paravrita trikonasana, the twisted triangle, Paravrita parsvakonasana, the twisted parsvakonasana, um, um, Paravrita uh, setu bandhasana. No, you can't do that. Uh, that's too hard. Uh, Paravrita, uh, janu, uh, Paravrita janu shirshasana, which is also a sort of a tough one. But the, the, uh, in English, it's the twisted half moon, uh, Paravrita Arda Chandrasana. These poses appear to put maximum pressure on the neck of the femur, which other ones do? The twists. Twists are not only good for the spine, they're also good for the hip. I mean, the spine is married to the hip and the sacroiliac joint is their illegitimate offspring. You know, <laughs> you, you can't move one without the other. And if you're twisting one, you're twisting the other. So uh, Marishyasana, Matsyendrasana, Bharadvajasana, these are very good. I suspect that Jatara Parivarchanasana is also good for the spine. So we don't, apart from these just suspicions based on figuring it out, sitting down, sitting down at a chair and figuring it out, we have to do it and look and see. And that's what I'm doing now, but it's not complete yet. <clears throat> I have some people that's doing three times. They do the pose three times a day for as long as they can. These are devoted yogis, you know, and we're seeing if that affects things. So far, the woman I who got so much better in her wrist, not better enough, but got better in her wrist. She was doing this pose that we invented. It's not really a yoga pose where you uh, interlock your fingers. Yeah, you're doing, Sarah's doing a great example. There, I'm pinning you, Sarah. So I hope everybody can see you anyway. I, so that's that Probably pose. not. I, I have you pinned big, but it's where you take your hands out in front and then squeeze, drawing them up in front of you to heart center. And then and then d d descend, let your hands descend and you start to feel it. You feel it in your wrists right there. There are these tiny little ends of bones, the radial styloid and the, the ulnar styloid. They, 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 the styloid means a pen and they're thin like the ancient quill uh, feathers that they use to write with. They get very thin and therefore they're very susceptible to fracture. Okay. So uh, that's, okay, that's the answer to that question, I guess. Next question, we could take a couple questions. Yeah, there's a really regular question that I'm seeing when you were talking about the forward folding and then people are asking, how are back bends really different? I know for me, when I give that explanation, I talk about the spinuous process limiting movement, but what would Dr. Fishman have to say about this? Well, I think the back bends are just fine. Um, it turns out w when I was talking about the cell membrane and the cell membrane is as long as it's deformed, it produces this electron volt inside and that electron volt makes for a chemical reaction. So a new molecule gets down into the nucleus. Well, one way to do that is to compress. Another way to do it is to bend to one side or the other. A third way to do it is to twist. But there's a fourth way to do it, which is to elongate the cell. And that's what the back bends do for the cells at the front of the spine. Because if now the person is facing this way again, the first vertebra is here, and now they're going back like this. So the fronts of the vertebra are getting further apart. This is very good for a uh, herniated disc and back pain also, but by, by you're putting pressure to stretch, you're actually stretching the vertebra. And, and uh, Christofellini and his cadavers did this too. It turns out that also builds, puts, increases the pressure and seems to build bone. So a back bend will build bone right up here at the front in a manner similar to the way twists do. So I don't see anything wrong with them because you're not, the back of the vertebra almost never fracture. Do you get arthritis there? You bet, especially in the facet joints. You do, and that limits how much you can bend back uh, mechanically. But I don't see anything wrong with back bends at all. Now, if you also have a concomitant condition of spinal stenosis, then 
the spine, that, that part of the spine that gets really thick when you're older, the ligamentum flavum, uh, does buckle up right where you don't want it to, right where the nerves are coming out of the spine at each level. So then there's that sort of a no-no. Otherwise, back bends seem to me to be perfectly okay. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting and important to bring up um, looking at spinal stenosis too. Um, something that I haven't seen that I will open a can of worms. <laughs> there are some other questions. People often ask about both scoliosis and osteoporosis um, and if there are things that they can do there. I don't see questions about that readily today. So let's look at the questions that are actually here. Um, there's a question. Let me interrupt you just for a second. I will take the next question too, but that's an important question because something unusual happens if you have a lot of scoliosis. Oh, here, I've got this lovely thing I can use to show you. This is something that's used, if you want to uh, use your phone as a camera. But suppose someone has a relatively straight spine. Well, the DEXA scan for the spine focuses right there at the center. And they get a number relating to how many of the x-rays that they send out get stopped by the uh, spine. But now, suppose you have a really nice curve there. Then the, the DEXA is still centered right there in the middle of your body, and it's missing the spine, either to a greater or lesser extent. Less, less scoliosis, it won't miss as much. So people with scoliosis often have, what is their hip DEXA uh, score? The T scale is minus 1.2. What is the femur scale? Minus 1.3. What is the spine scale? Minus 4.9. Now, what's happening? Why is the spine so bad? This is a systemic condition. Why is the spine so aberrant, so much worse? Why is it the outlier answer? Because it's curved and because of the scoliosis. So if that is the case, there are other studies which are not quite as good. There are ultrasound studies that you can get that are not as accurate, but you could at least see if your spine has a comparable bone mineral density to what you get elsewhere in the body. So that, that's one important thing. The other thing, this is a paid political announcement on my part. Um, I'm doing a study on scoliosis, for, not for anybody in this webinar. It's for children between 12 and 20. And we're using yoga. I've published it about five times. Yoga all by itself strengthens the weak side of the spine, this side, the curvy spine curvy part strengthens it about anywhere from two and a half to five and a half percent a month. It really makes a difference. And it's made a difference in literally hundreds of people that I've treated. Now in this study, which is funded, so it's free, um, absolutely no money at all. In fact, we will pay for your x-rays. Um, we use the yoga to strengthen the weak side and we use botulinum toxin to temporarily weaken the strong side which is the concave side. And we find we've got, we've got more than 20 patients in the study already. Uh, we need another 20 uh, or so. And um, we find that they get 10 to 15 degrees better in three weeks. And they get another few degrees better in three months. And so far, no one, yeah, one person got worse. You know, we, we saw her more than a year ago. She did completely quit yoga. And after she quit, she lost the gains that she had before. She went right back having the scoliosis. But others, everybody else has continued to uh, improve. So all you have to do is call my office, go to sciatica.org and you'll see. And as I say, it's totally free. One visit to my office. So if you're in California or New Zealand, I have patients in from New Zealand. I do in Australia, but uh, you come one time and you get all you need. And so uh, I'd love to have people in the study because I think there are something like 100 million people on this earth that have scoliosis and the surgery is expensive, both monetarily and in terms of the um, stiffness and deficits you retain for the rest of your life and unnecessary in the vast majority of cases. So I just so want to take my paid political yes. on it. Okay. Absolutely, so go for it. <laughs> there's um, there's a, a question about the initial study that I think is, is important. Um, please explain the term 
um, nomogram mentioned in the initial study analysis with respect to the included results from patients on bone hardening meds. So this one is way beyond my understanding. <laughs> well, a, nom a nomogram is uh, uh, a chart, but it's a chart with numbers rather than, you know, Ohio and Maryland on it. Uh, a nomogram says, if your value is this, here's what your bone mineral density is. If your age is this, it, you know, it's a way of measuring. It's it's a common term. It's in the dictionary. You know, a nomogram is a way to uh, calculate things. Like they might say, um, how many calories should you eat? Well, on this on this scale, they have how old you are, and on this scale, they have how many calories you should eat. And then by looking at the uh, how old you are, you can figure you can see how how many calories you should take in a day. That's a nomogram, and they have them for. DEXA scans too, so that if your bone mineral density is 0. 0.654, then your uh, T scale score is, and they'll give you a number, you know, minus 2.3. <clears throat> so that's that's a, a simple answer to what sounds like a terribly difficult question. <clears throat> I love it. Simple answers well, are good. Well, Sarah, there Dr. Are... Fishman, just to um and um Lauren, it's Kathy, Kathy Lilly here. I asked that question. And Hi, why Kathy. it comes up. Hi. As you know, with the initial study, the 11 um, patients, the top two were on Boniva and, oh, excuse me, the, first, the top one was on Forteo, uh, the second one was on Bonilla, Boniva. And so in terms of that um, scale that you just mentioned, looking to wrap around, understand how their results were calibrated to be um, included, especially because they were the top two patients in the initial 2009 yoga versus osteoporosis study. So that's what I'm looking at. Because a lot of people, they read the study, you may even hear, and they think that all that were selected as far as the patient um, data analysis were not on bone hardening drugs. So Wait, which study are you talking about? The one with the 1,000? 2009, 2009. Wait. What's the name of the study? Um, well, I have, I have it yeah. over here. To topics of geriatric medicine, the one where your name is listed and the formal name. Give me a moment. Oh, no, that's okay. Now I know what you, I think I know the one you mean. I know yeah, the, 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 the one you were showing charts from. Yeah, well, the study. That one, I have to tell you, Kathy, are you, I think you were, you were in the office then. I don't know. I, I was. I, I taught them, and you gave me compliments. But um, patients, just looking for transparency and understanding. Thank yeah, you. Well, the reason I did that study, as I told you, was because my friend said, you're crazy. You're going to break their bones. And I was mostly interested in finding out whether it was safe or not. And then when my son found it to be statistically significant, that's when I decided to publish it. I actually did not remember that the two of those patients were on medications when they started. And I didn't really care because what I was really interested in was, was it going to be safe for them? Or were, gonna, were they going to have problems? Um, but I did publish it. And the bigger study where we had a thousand patients, and I think about a quarter of them actually ended up being compliant and doing everything they were supposed to do. Um, that, that yeah, study, I was around for that one too, 2015. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That study, there was nobody who took any medicines at all, as far as I can recall. Not nobody. In fact, that was one of the conditions. They couldn't take steroids because that's bad for your bones. And they couldn't take any of the medicines that you take because those were good for your bones. And we couldn't determine whether they were getting better because of the medicines or because of the yoga. But yeah, she was she was you. very particular and um, methodical in, in yeah. all that data. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you're well. I haven't seen you in a long time. I hope life is good for you. I'm doing great. But I'm obviously uh, still very much curious, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, let's take one more question, then we'll quit. Okay. All right. So I'm seeing lots of questions about was nutrition major, was nutrition measured and it, was there anything that, that had to do with nutrition? I mean, a, a tiny bit, yes. We asked them to take vitamin D, three, 1,500 milligrams. 
uh, are 1,500 international units. And we asked them to take calcium, 1,500 milligrams, unless they were over 75, when the liability for kidney stones and calcification of the aorta uh, and other parts of the body come in. They're over age 75, we said, only take 500 milligrams of calcium. So we did measure nutrition in that way. I mean, we did augment their nutrition, which is just what the drug companies do when they test uh, the drugs for osteoporosis. So I felt totally right about doing it. You know, I didn't feel I was cheating at all to do that. Um, other nutrition, we did not measure at all. What we did, as I said, is we said, whatever you were doing in the first two years before you started the study, do the same thing in these two years because we want to compare apples with apples. You know, don't start, don't become a vegan or stop being a vegan. You know, whatever you are, continue. We, we did ask people if they were vegans and I will have statistics on that when we finish the study, which will be about another year we'll be done with the study. God willing, I'll publish the results. God and the publishers being willing. <laughs> okay, well, so, Absolutely much. amazing. Okay, Dr. thank Fishman, you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Such a good interlocutor. You really are. You're good at it. And all of you, thank you. I hope I haven't talked you into submission. I hope you're going to have a good day. I wish you very well. Kathy, it is very nice to hear from you. And so many other people that I know. Betty, I can't see you, but I, I can't go through it. But anyway, love to you all. Have a wonderful weekend and a happy Easter. A wonderful Easter. Bye. Thank you. I hope that you have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us.